Good morning. So, as I mentioned earlier, I get really excited about infectious disease, gonorrhea, <laughs> acne, all kinds of postulant wound forming agents. Um, so, um, in, this, in this talk, I'm going to focus on acne. I mean, this is something that affects about 85% of teenagers. I know that I sure battled it when I was a teenager, even into later adulthood. Um, What's interesting about acne, though, is that we still don't have very good therapies for it. The, the most common over-the-counter therapy is um, salicylic acid. It's just sold in different formulations. By the way, don't buy the expensive stuff and look at the ingredients. It's all the same exact stuff. Just put in a fancier bottle. So you can get the same drug for a few bucks versus, you know, 80 proactive is just another form of that. Um, I want to, uh, before I start, I definitely want to mention my co authors, several of which are here in the audience. Kate Nelson is my microbiology guru who has run most of these tests. Tracy Lee, also an undergraduate, ran a lot of these tests as well in the micro lab. And Dr. Lyles, who um, battled with the HPLC many a night for the chemistry on this. And my um, other authors help with uh, um, also some bioactivity testing, and um, Dr. Saita from Italy sent us the fungi we used in this study as well. So I wanted to give you an overall approach of the direction where my lab is going um, for um, some of these different uh, projects. This is a good example. In this case, we're really trying to apply ethnobotany as a lens to understanding biological and chemical diversity and to identify uh, potential sources of novel antibacterial agents. Um, through this lens, we then have created a natural products library. We now have over 400 species in that library composed of plants and fungi from everywhere from the Mediterranean all the way to um, the southeastern um, USA. We then take those natural products, usually as crude extracts, and submit them to a number of bioassays. In this case, I'm only going to focus on acne, but we do work on all the other major uh, multi-drug resistant pathogens in the lab. Um, this is an example of a biofilm assay where we use a simple crystal violet stain. I don't know if there's a cleaner here. Um, so then we identify the most active extracts. We also do counter screening. I think counter screen, I can't. Um, I can't emphasize the importance of this enough. It's, you can have something that works really fantastically against the bacteria, but if at the same time it makes your skin fall off, that's not necessarily something you want to pursue. Um, usually when we're focused on therapies that are used already in traditional medicine for the skin, we don't see so many problems with having high cytotoxicity. Um, on the other hand, we also have a collection of randomly um, selected plants to use as a, as a comparison, and then those sometimes we do have um, extreme toxicity. And then we go on to chemical characterization. So as I mentioned, acne impacts more than 85% of teens. It leaves um, long-term scarring, especially for severe cases of acne. Um, what's most alarming, and I've learned more about this when I joined the Department of Dermatology at Emory, is that for, for patients that have really severe um, chronic acne, they'll often be put on cycles of antibiotics. And these antibiotics can are usually oral, combined with um, uh, retin-A or retinoids um, that are applied topically, but they go on these antibiotics for six months at a time. Now, if you've paid any attention at all to the work that's going on now with understanding impact of antibiotics on the gut microbiome, you can understand why this is probably not great for those patients in the long run. But it really is the only method we have at this stage for treating biofilm. Now, what's interesting is that in recent years, we've really come to understand the importance of biofilms in acne pathogenesis. Biofilm is kind of, could be described as kind of a slimy exopolysaccharide uh, goop that bacteria excrete and they like to hide in. And this is considered a pathogenesis factor or a virulence factor that also contributes to the inflammation um, of the acne and can lead to scarring. Acne is interesting in that it is a um, gram positive organism, it is a strict anaerobe. That's why it likes to live deep in your pores where no oxygen can reach them. So the aims of this study were to compare the antibacterial activity, specifically against acne, of ethnobotanically identified um, plants used for the skin and skin infections, um, for compared to a random collection of species using in vitro models for growth and biofilm maintenance. 
And then the second aim is to characterize any hits that we came across. Now, before we go on, this is really an ethnobotanical story, but I want to note that the species tested that were selected, this was based on topical use for the skin for, in general, skin infections, skin inflammations. It was not specific to acne. Um, sometimes they may not even call it acne. Acne in, 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 in infants as well um, as in adults is not always called that <coughs> in, in different cultures. So this was just general skin eruptions, inflammations, and things like that. So here are some of my study sites where I've worked with colleagues in the Mediterranean. Most of the plants and fungi used in this study come from more of southern Italy, um, in a region in, in, um, around uh, the Silicata, also in Sicily, and here in Pantelleria, um, off the coast of Tunisia, which is also still part of Italy. So for the methods, um, I, we're, we've published heavily on all of our field research, so I'm not going to focus so much on that today, but um, in all of these field studies, we followed prior informed consent, we followed proper procedures for um, through collaborative agreements with universities in Italy to export these materials. Um, and this has been conducted really over the past 15 years. Um, all the plant materials that we collected had batteries that have been deposited both in Italy and in the U.S. They now are deposited at Emory University, um, and these are collected with permissions. In our more, more recent collections, we're also collecting plant DNA to accompany um, those. Um, for the extractions, most of those that are tested were done as crude extractions, either in um, organic solvents like methanol or ethanol, or by um, procuring a decoction in water to try and some, uh, replicate some of the traditional therapies. It is not possible to always replicate the traditional therapy to a T. Some of these are used fresh, they're pounded into a poultice, poultice and applied topically, and, ooh, and we, have to, uh, we have to extract those. Okay, I'm going to pull a Dr. Merlin today. <laughs> Um, so the conditions are anaerobes, uh, they're, uh, they're looking at growth inhibition, we did counter screening, and then um, HPLC. So here's the, here's the money shot, right? So we did find a significant difference in, in um, activity between um, plants used for, for skin and soft tissue infection versus no noted skin activity. This is only at a, a P of less than 0 0.05, so it's, it's not huge, huge significance, but there, but there is a significant difference. Also, we found the same for biofilm emission. These are the species that we found to be most active. So we had uh, uh, a fungus, a uh, haplopilus relens, or the tender nesting polypore, which we were initially excited about because it also inhibited biofilm at, a, um, I think, about 45%, which was better than anything that we've ever seen before. Unfortunately, and I'll show you the data in a moment, when we put it on skin cells, it also killed all the skin cells. <laughs> um, and when Dr. Lyles went into the chemistry, we discovered why, um, and I'll, I'll go over that in a moment. Um, we also found some activity in garden vetch, sweet chestnut, which we already knew a bit about from our work on chestnut, but it also inhibited acne, did not really inhibit biofilm. Um, walnut, rosemary, grapevine, and um, this Ascidella species. So what's interesting about um, half of uh, pilus uh, brutalans is that it actually has a high level of polyporic acid, which is responsible for the purple color. And this is actually also apparently highly toxic if ingested and leads to purple discoloration of urine, um, nausea, vomiting, blurred visions, hallucinations, and death. Um, no reported skin toxicity has been found, but we dropped that as a, uh, as a lead after that. Um, you have a uh, garden vetch, uh, also had some interesting activity, and this is uh, 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 in the Fabaceae family. Interesting, it's mainly used as a fodder for livestock, um, and we have examined it before for antibacterial activity in staff, but did not find anything. So this is um, also non-toxic and abundantly available, so it could have some, some potential for development. Um, chestnut, which I've mentioned, um, had some interesting um, antibacterial activity. This has been used, the leaves have been used in washes and rinses for a number of different skin infections and inflammations. 
And walnut is, um, the fruits of walnut in particular, are also used uh, to treat fungal infections um, traditionally and also for dyeing hair and other skin applications. Um, rosemary has other skin applications. This did uh, have some mild inhibitory growth. Um, we did find it also in Snap aureus has some inhibition of, of toxicity as well. Um, grapevine, this is the Alianico variety of grape, but I found this to be in really interesting because you have this, um, this interesting relationship between acne and grapevines that I wasn't aware of before this study. Um, we didn't find any um, toxicity in the cells uh, with the treatment with grape, but let me see, I'm going to find this moment. Oh, there, there have been some phylogenetic um, and population genetic research that has suggested that there's a been a horizontal inner kingdom um, uh, transfer of the human opportunistic pathogen to grapevine as an obligate endophyte, which I thought was really, really interesting. Um, and then we have as Asphodelus. So for cytotoxicity, most of these are non-toxic. Of course, you did have the Apollo, um, Pylus rutilans was quite toxic, as was Juglans um, regia, or walnut shows some toxicity um, to skin cells. Chemically, the major um, source of toxicity was polyporic acid and that fungus, and then the source of a lot of the bioactivity were some common um, phenolic acids that were found. Not all of these peaks were identified. There may be some room for um, identification of, of, of other compounds responsible for activity. This is based on comparison with standards. So in summary, we looked at 157 extracts derived from um, 10 fungi and 58 plants. Um, we, looked, we found crude extracts from seven species exhibited growth inhibitory activities. Um, we had one fungus and one plant species were toxic and um, already went over the chemistry. There was a shared chemistry um, where you had presence of chlorogenic acid, cumeric acid, elagic acid, gallic acid, and tannic acid. Um, so in conclusion, there is a, um, an interesting story here again to be told, I think especially if you're targeting your screen and really comparing traditional uses to randomly um, collected plants. And we interestingly also found three species that have never before been reported for anti-acne activity that might be worth further exploration. Unfortunately, these do not inhibit biofilm, they only inhibit growth, but there still could be some potential for um, application. Here's part of my research group. I want to thank them uh, for all the work that they do. And um, my funding was from BioNorca um, Global Research Initiative. And I'll take any questions with you. Time.